Thank you, everybody. Uh, it's nice to be here. I'm very honored to be presenting um, and introducing you to the Organized Crime Index as one of the cornerstone projects of the ENACT program. I just wanted to uh, give you a brief overview of some information um, on the ENACT program. ENACT was uh, born because there was this growing recognition um, that over the past decade, there had been some dramatic shifts um, in the conversation surrounding transnational organized crime in Africa. Um, overall, the continent has enjoyed um, increasing stability and rising economic growth, um, but it's that these very circumstances that have also unfortunately in cross-border criminal activity, and that these trends pose challenges not only to the African continent, uh, but to the surrounding regions as well. Um, and so with that in mind, as a step towards developing more long-term effective responses, uh, the ENACT program has two overall aims. Um, the first one is to build the knowledge and offer evidence-based analysis of transnational organized crime in Africa, which we in hope will in turn um, inform policy and enhance cooperation at the regional and continental levels. Um, and second, to build the skills and capacity among key African stakeholders like yourselves to better respond to transnational organized crime and uh, mitigate its impact. Um, and so based on these overarching goals, we've developed the Organized Crime Index as the first tool of its kind um, in providing a multi-dimensional assessment of the scope and scale of organized crime and the capacity of countries to respond effectively. Next slide. Thank you. Um, so the first question we should ask ourselves is, why should we measure organized crime? Uh, well, in measuring it, we're taking the first steps to combating it. Um, so you see here on the slide, uh, the purpose of the index is really to provide uh, constructive guidance to policymakers and regional bodies so that they can prioritize their interventions um, based on a multifaceted assessment of where their strengths and vulnerabilities lie. Uh, we also hope to catalyze attention to the growing threat of organized crime on the continent um, and also guide responses to organized crime that are, um, and this is key, not solely criminal justice or security driven, but really approach the, the phenomenon through a socioeconomic perspective. Um, we also hope with this tool, we're able to provide stakeholders with the means to measure the efficacy of their interventions. Um, and also promote this evidence-based analysis and research. Um, and finally, uh, we hope that the index will provide uh, insight into trends nationally and continentally, and hopefully with future iterations of the tool, offer a predictive function of uh, organized crime environments. Now, having said all of that, um, this is an index, so we should take it with a grain of salt. Numbers and scores will only get you so far. Um, so what we really want to do is frame this index as a tool, as a way to um, serve as a conversation starter and really form the basis and supplement to further research. Next slide, please. So let's look at the overall structure of this index. All 54 countries on the African continent are assigned two scores. You'll see here on top, first, the countries are led by their criminality score, which is comprised of two components. We have criminal actors and criminal markets, and each of these components is scored on a scale of one to 10, uh, where one is the best, meaning, for example, a criminal market just does not exist, um, or 10 is the worst, meaning a criminal art market or group um, is so pervasive that no aspect of society goes untouched by it. And second, countries are scored um, for their resilience. So you see that down in blue. The resilience score is comprised of what we call 12 building blocks of resilience, each of which is also scored on a one to 10 scale, but it's the opposite here. So a one is the worst, meaning that the resilience measure just does not exist. And then by contrast, a 10 would be the best where the resilience measure not only exists, but is extremely effective in responding to the organized crime situation. And so you'll see here on this slide, country scores are visualized um, with a criminality pyramid. I mean, this is actually what you would see if you go to the index website, ocindex.net, um, where the height of the pyramid represents a higher or a lower criminal actor score, and the base of the pyramid or the width um, represents a higher or lower criminal market score. Um, by contrast, you will see this blue wall or blue pillars um, which represents country's resilience. So the higher the wall, the more resilience a country would have, the lower the wall, the less resilience it would have. 
Um, so I hope you can see on top, it's not too small. We see different examples of country scores being visualized, some with higher or lower resilience walls, more narrow or higher um, criminality pyramids. So now just focusing on the criminality score, uh, we'll just look at criminal markets first. We're looking at 10 distinct criminal markets that are outlined here, um, ranging from human trafficking to arms to environmental and drugs. Um, and when we say we're assessing criminal markets, what we're really looking at is two things in every criminal market. First, the value, so it's a monetary impact. And second, it's reach, what we call our non-monetary impact. So these are things, when we describe reach, we're talking about the degree of pervasiveness of any activity relating to a criminal market, from the production to the transit to the use um, we are considering things like number of victims, uh, location of the market, um, how much the degree of violence involved in carrying out the criminal activity, um, the scarcity of the commodity involved, and so on. So as I said, criminal markets form only one component of the criminality score, and the second component is criminal actors. And with criminal actors, what we're looking at is two things. First, the degree of structure of the criminal group. And second, the extent of the group's control and influence. And so what we've done with this index is come up with four general criminal actor typologies, recognizing, of course, that not all criminal actors will fall neatly into one category or another. Um, so first uh, grouping we have is the mafia-style groups. These are groups with known names. They may have defined leadership. They're more likely uh, control territory and employ violence in carrying out their activities. Um, the second group we have are criminal networks. The criminal networks are more loosely based networks of criminal associates engaging in illicit activities. Uh, thirdly, we have state embedded actors, and these are criminal actors that are embedded in and working um, from within the state apparatus. And finally, we have these foreign criminal actors. Um, these are state or non-state criminal actors operating outside of their home countries. So as you see through the slide, uh, we consider a number of different uh, factors in assessing criminal actors. It varies depending on the country context, but these are any one of um, many factors to consider when we're looking at their um, influence. So I've just gone over the different parts of a country's criminality score. And as I said, the countries also assign a resilience score. And the resilience score is comprised of 12 indicators, 12 building blocks that you see are listed here. And for the index, the country's resilience capacity and effectiveness um, it really evaluated to assess the level at which states have the established the appropriate frameworks to address organized crime in their country. So for example, we would not give a lower score to country A for not having wildlife trafficking legislation if wildlife crimes do not exist in that country. Um, so when we say we're looking at resilience, we're really asking ourselves two questions. Uh, first, does the country have a resilience measure in place? Um, and second, how effective in the implementation of that resilience measure to combat organized crime in that country? So I've given you just a brief overview of the structure of the index. I would like to switch to uh, giving you a summary of the methodology. Um, so you see starting from top, the scoring process, we started out with a team of research assistants um, that carry out an extensive literature review, drawing on information and data from data sets where available um, to create a country profile. And the country profiles outline the three components of markets, actors, and resilience. Now, once these country profiles are created, they are scored by internal experts, so experts from the ENACT consortium. And these experts do three things when looking at a profile. First, they'll score each component on a scale of one to 10. Second, they may add or detract information, but they have to justify the scores that they provide. And third, they need to assign a confidence level score, um, which essentially tells us how uh, confident they are in the scores that they've assigned. Um, and we do this mainly because it's impossible to find an expert who knows every aspect about a given country with 100% certainty. Um, so confidence level scores are an internal way for us to identify areas that may need um, extra verification. 
So following these initial internal scores, we prepare profiles for external expert verification. And these external experts do essentially the same thing as internal experts. They look at a country profile, um, and this time with initial scores and justifications, and then will input their own scores, justifications, and confidence levels. Now, um, in parallel to these sort of these country experts that look at it externally, we also carry out uh, somatic scoring. And with somatic scoring, really, so up until this point, experts consider a country in and of itself by, by itself. What thematic scoring does is allow an expert in a specific criminal market to look at all countries in a given region for that one particular market. So of course, index, an index is a comparative tool. So thematic scoring allows us to see country scores in relation to one another. Um, for example, country A might have a score of eight for human smuggling, but when taking into account other countries, that score might go down to a six because it's compared to country B, which has a far more pervasive human smuggling market. Um, so, so following these sort of parallel expert uh, review streams, all expert input is consolidated um, and prepared for a final review by regional geographic experts. Um, and these experts are not necessarily organized crime experts. They may come from a range of backgrounds like academia, economics, civil society, criminal justice, um, and their job is really to serve as the final review of all the scores, to make sure that they actually make sense realistically within a broader regional context. Um, and so that's generally what it is. I will say a couple of points about the scoring process. Throughout the entire, this entire stage, all experts are anonymous um, to avoid bias and extent, um, to the extent possible in the evaluations. Um, and also all experts were given the same guidance documents that include guiding questions, um, any definitions involved, um, and scoring thresholds to make sure that there's consistency in the evaluation and scoring process. Um, so then now that I've given you sort of a broad understanding of, of the structure and the methodology, let's turn to last year's results. Um, so these are the findings that were published in 2019 and they reflect the situation of 2018. Um, looking at criminality, I hope it's not too small. Um, criminality looking at actors and markets, African countries are shown through these gray bars, and you'll notice these 11 yellow bars. These signify what we call benchmark countries. Um, these are countries from around the world that were not published last year, but were really just an internal way for us to gauge African country scores within a global context. Um, now, an important note to make when you're interpreting criminality scores, uh, countries with higher diversity in criminal markets will have higher scores compared to countries with maybe one or two extremely pervasive criminal markets. Um, so as I said, it's important to not focus too much on the numbers alone and really dig deeper into the country context. Um, on the other hand, even countries that have limited markets, uh, the scoring system, of course, takes into account the strength of criminal actors. And so we found that you know, criminal, uh, countries with criminal markets that are high also tend to have high criminal actor scores. So let's just quickly break down the criminality score in terms of markets. Um, we see that the continental average of the criminal market score uh, was 4.68 out of 10. Um, human trafficking scored the highest uh, with a continental average of 5.36 and cocaine at the bottom with an average of 3.40. So here's another way to look at the scores. Um, through these scoring heat maps, the results of the index demonstrate that there's some clearly demarcated uh, trafficking routes and patterns. Um, for example, if you look at the drug markets, the cannabis scored the highest uh, continentally, and you see that here, looking at all the darker shades across the entire continent. Um, by contrast, countries along the eastern and southern coast of Africa, so Kenya, Tanzania, uh, Mozambique and South Africa scored uh, highest in heroin market. And in fact, this is where they're the most uh, darkly shaded. Um, on the other hand, you see human trafficking. They, like I said, that criminal market was scored the highest continentally. And in fact, the entire continent is quite dark. Whereas flora and fauna, um, you see the, the darker shaded countries are those in the center of the continent where biodiversity is high. So turning to the actors portion of the criminality score, uh, we found with the results that criminal actors are actually a bigger driver of criminality um, than criminal markets. 
And this is clearly seen in the numbers. So 74% of countries have higher criminal actor scores than criminal market scores. Um, of the four different actor types, state embedded actors were the most prominent criminal actors across the continent. Um, in 40 out of the 54 countries, um, which represent almost three quarters of, the, of all the countries on the continent, state embedded criminal actors have, were designated as having a significant or severe influence on society and state structures. Um, on the other end of the spectrum, we see mafia style, group, style groups, which were by far the least prevalent criminal actor type in Africa, with a median score of just two, and no fewer than 18 countries registering scores of one. So I don't know if you can see in this, um, this little table here, you see 18 countries, it shows the numbers within each circle, how many countries were scored, uh, depending on, the, on which pillar they're in. Um, so turning to resilience, again, these yellow bars signify benchmark countries, and the African ones are reflected in these gray bars. Um, I don't want to spend too much time on this slide. Again, I would encourage you all to visit ocindex.net, where you really can take the time to look through all these tables and graphs um, and delve into the country profiles specifically. Um, so let's just break down resilience by indicator. Um, importantly, no safe resilience building block had a continental average of greater than five, suggesting the need for some major improvements in response mechanisms to organized crime across the continent. Um, so each of these building blocks is distinct, but we can still find some natural groupings, and from there we can pull out some trends. Um, so, for example, indicators that were political or legally oriented had higher averages than other indicator groups, as you see, um, in the national policies and laws in, in that top uh, category. Um, we also Africa is relative, We also see that Africa is relatively stronger um, in the emphasis on criminal justice measures compared to other uh, spheres of society. And finally, there is a clear lack of emphasis on social protection measures. So the two state resilience indicators that had the lowest continental averages were you see on the bottom in green, victim and witness protection, uh, support and protection, and prevention. So criminality and resilience alone only tell one side of the story. So it's very important to look at them together. Um, before I begin this quick analysis, um, it's important to recognize in any comparison, in any analysis, states start off on unequal footing because they have inherent vulnerabilities that are maybe unique and that cannot be helped. So for example, a country that naturally has the long land borders will be more vulnerable to a smaller than a smaller country because of the more effort it takes to patrol these borders. Uh, similarly, countries with naturally high biodiversity may be more vulnerable to environmental crimes. So it's important to keep that in mind before undertaking any analysis um, continentally or regionally. Uh, so having said that, you'll see this quadrant where the vertical axis represents you know, high resilience to low resilience, and the horizontal axis goes from low crime to high crime. Um, and you'll see there's this cluster uh, of, of countries on sort of the bottom half of the, of the quadrants, and this shows that overall resilience in Africa is low. Um, but a positive qualifier to that is that even though most of Africa has low resilience to organized crime, the most common situation for countries was to also have low criminality. Um, by contrast, there were 20 countries that were in the most precarious uh, situation with high criminality and low resilience. So that would be in that red quadrant here. Uh, 11 countries were in the most desirable situation where they had low criminality and high resilience. And this you'll see in that small cluster in the green, in the green quadrant at the top. And finally, only three countries, Nigeria, Kenya, and South Africa, had high criminality, but also very high resilience. So, to, so it was sort of a counterintuitive uh, situation. So let's, looking at, uh, let's look at the implications of these results. So for those three countries that I mentioned, South Africa, Tanzania, and Nigeria, um, countries with high resilience and high criminality, it could be that, it's, it's counterintuitive, but it could be that you know, without these resilience measures in place, the organized crime situation would have been far more severe. Alternatively, it could be that there may have been an emphasis, a heavy emphasis on government resilience measures, 
and in which case countries in these situations may need to look to um, sort of more whole, whole of society approaches to, to resilience. Um, by contrast, this group of low resilience and high criminality, which unfortunately represents a large portion of the continent you see here in red, um, for these countries, we ask, what can they do? Well, first, starting off, countries in these situations need to identify the vulnerabilities in their countries um, that can actually be helped and try to address those. Uh, one point, one source to look at would be this index to see what has worked actually in other countries. Um, and finally, to use that to develop sort of multi-sectoral approaches to, to responding, although we recognize that it's, it's, it's certainly not easy um, and it definitely depends on the context of each country. Uh, the third grouping, uh, countries with high resilience and low criminality, for these countries, it may appear that they're doing everything right and there's no need to do anything else, um, but that's not necessarily true. Um, for these countries, promoting success stories of states um, that have built up their resilience and address criminal markets is really key. Um, they can also work to expand through country cross-border uh, cross and regional cooperation and should also always be um, monitoring any changing dynamics regarding organized crime um, because it's never a static phenomenon. Um, and finally, the last group, uh, countries with low resilience, but also low criminality. Um, we ask ourselves, why should we bother to build up response measures? Um, for these, again, organized crime, um, there's a, it's always evolving based on the conditions that might not necessarily be helped. Um, and there's no guarantee that it won't increase in the future. So for countries that find themselves in these situations, an emphasis on prevention uh, would, be, would be important. Um, and just some quick uh, key implications from the results. Uh, the prominence of criminal actors and particularly state embedded actors, coupled with the uh, overall low resilience, suggests two possibilities. First, that resilience measures in place currently focus on combating specific criminal markets um, with not enough emphasis maybe on deterring or stopping criminal actors themselves. And second, uh, resilience measures in place actually may be sound, uh, but there may be obstacles from, from within the state apparatus um, that may block effective implementation of these measures. And so in, in doing in considering all of these different implications, of course, responses to organized crime needs to be tailored, but we found that there's three broad constants that apply to all, um, all countries. First, responses to organized crime need to be multi-sectoral. Second, resilience measures already in place may have little purpose and impact without safeguards to ensure their effective implementation. And third, responses to organized crime must be flexible enough to keep up with the evolving organized crime phenomenon. And these are some, some final key takeaways um, in terms of the, of the index. Again, there's value in building data and evidence base um, so that we can see how the nature of organized crime functions with resilience um, and the utility of this tool of this index will grow with time. Um, second, political will and committed leadership can really have tangible impacts. Uh, the successes of countries are really insufficiently highlighted and they really need to be promoted. Um, thirdly, effective responses require a foundation of good governance and the rule of law. And finally, sources of resilience can come both from state and a diverse range of non-state actors, really taking that whole of society approach. And so I'll, I know I thought we went over the time. I'll stop here just to say that we're currently actually working on the second iteration of the index. Um, we're explaining it to have a global scope. But for Africa specifically, we'll have that added benefit um, of having done it last year. So we'll be able to see these evolving trends over the last couple of years. And um, with that, thank you very much.